for a better life beyond your freedom. Build back better. Welcome to Salonomics with me, Aaron Dawn, and my best friend, Joe Mehmet. Hi, Joe. Hi, Aaron. How you doing? I'm well, mate. I'm well. Did you um did you like the jingle? Uh, um, you know, it's so bad. But it's actually quite good. You feel what I mean? <laughs> you, you know, it, it, it kind of like thinking, right, it's not stylized. It's not so manufactured. It's not clinical. It's not like what everybody would perceive as a jingle. Like, it's, it's so bad that I quite like it. <laughs> no, I love it. I think I think when you put jingles on the radio, they're really, really powerful. They can really yeah, get into your, like, you know, deep. They're subliminal. They go right into your brain, right? <laughs> And the way we're going to look at it, we're not really, we haven't got anything to sell, are we? We're just going to be sort of like um, its opinions, our points of view. Things. We're not actually selling a product to, to masses, are we? So, you know, we'd have to spend an awful, awful lot of um, money or effort just to get a jingle, really, I, I suppose. That's what I, I would think about it, really. Yeah, I'm just going to borrow them for the time being, though, until we can figure that out. But um... Exactly. And, and you know, you know, if we start sort of like making some spondulies, then you know, we we improve our production. Um, well, that's why I'm here. I'm here to monetize having to talk to you every single day of my life. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. It, it, it'd be interesting to make some money from talking, eh? That's all right. That's right. I mean, we we are world class talkers. I think most hairdressers are, right? That's right. They got. They got to. I, mean, I remember when we when I first started hairdressing, right? Mm. Um, you know, as an apprentice in the seventies, there, there was three things that my employer told me never to talk about. Even though, even though I was kind of like a bit of a dirtbag when I left school, because uh, I left with school no qualification, I didn't really know. I really didn't know about sex. I didn't know about religion. I didn't know about um, politics. So it says to me, like you know, so when I when I got a job, right? There's three things you never talk about to a client. Sex, religion, and politics. I thought, okay, I don't know about those subjects anyway, so there's no point talking about it. But <laughs> that was education that you actually learn. But then as you get older and you listen and you listen and you listen and you listen, you actually do learn about sex, religion, and politics. With well, that- I suppose, you know, the times when you worked... 80s and 90s with a heyday, right? You know, you were dealing with high net worth individuals, right? So I suppose they would have some pretty powerful insights into all of those subject matters, uh, you yeah, know, listen. had you brought them up, you know? Well, no, look, listen, I'm, I never brought up any subject, right? Because, you know, so even, even as a junior, you you, you, you you were standing there holding the hair, passing the roller, passing the brush, you know, you would do these kind of things, so you're listening. Uh, you know, you're not listening to the conversation because you have to blank that blank that out, right? So you're watching, and you listen to the instructions uh, from the hairdresser, you know, sure. the past hairdresser. And you have to be literally, you have to be literally five or ten seconds ahead of him. Okay, so when he's doing a section, you have to get the next section ready. And when you, when he's passing a roller, you have to get the next roller ready. The pins, all these kind of things. So you actually learn to be perceptive. So you you're listening. I mean, can you imagine it? I mean, this is the first time I actually sort of talk about this. And, you know, I mean, it's kind of very natural. You talk about the sun I was working in New Camden Street. There's all these hairdressers, hair drives moving. There's people talking this and that. And there's all these ex- activities, and yet you focus on your hairdresser, you know, because he was my... Um, my 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 instructor, my tutor, my mentor, whatever, and I was a junior, right? It's a bit like a sort of like I wasn't being submissive, but I don't get me. There's no sort of sexual connotation involved with it, but I'm listening to him. So you have to focus. So you have to switch everything off around you so you can focus on that. And and because you concentrated so much on that, you're not really listening to the conversation. So you're not really learning anything. So for those that don't know the legend that is Joe Mehmet, why don't you um, give us a brief background into where you did your apprenticeship, Joe? And Well, well I mean, okay, listen, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate to think that the salon that I, I started with, Neville Daniel, uh, Daniel Hutchison and Neville Tucker, it was a most amazing salon. And, and they actually grew up to, they, they actually did expand to having 
three most amazing salons. New Cavendish Street, Sloan Street, and King's Road. And, and I worked in all three salons. And, and then eventually the partnership did falter in the beginning of the 90s. Daniel Hutchison went his way in Conjure Street and Neville Tucker went his way in Tupon Street. And, you know, it was a very hard choice to, to go to uh, because I, I really respect Daniel Hutchison, you know, entirely. You know, I, I'll do anything for the guy. But where he went into Mayfield, I just saw, like, the, the nice British environment and I stayed there where, where my clients were and this and that. Sure. And, and working at Neville's, again, working in that area in, in uh, SW1, again, it was just the most amazing experiences of dealing with... I'm not going to say ultra high network people, uh, individuals, but you, it's just an amazing environment. But, you know, you're not, you're not, we're not dealing with celebrities. We did, we didn't deal with film stars or pop stars. Or we just dealt with the most amazing people. Sure. Was there was there a difference between um, like the Neville Daniel semantics in the salon to the Daniel Hershersons? You know, even when it was Neville Dan- Daniels, was there a difference in their philosophy in the way they did things? Is that what caused a split? Well, the, 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 the cause is bit like any partnership, right? Marriages and relationships. It, it's always about money. And, and that's what eventually happened. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into internals because it's. Uh, and I was there when it all happened, so I could I could speak it from a from a sort of like an outsider's point of view. Uh, obviously, Neville and Daniel will have their uh, their own views, but you know, one of them will agree with me. In terms of the work, though, in terms, in terms of the, like you know, was for example, was Neville's more focused on the Knights Bridge crowd, like you're talking about, and and Daniel was more focused on the kind of the younger crowd i mean was that was that a separation you know how bands always suffer musical differences right was there hairdressing differences well there was, the, the only difference that we don't had right what became personal it wasn't professional i mean i think you know it's all like daniel and neville always agree right professionally speaking it was the most amazing relationship. It really was. It, it wasn't a yin and yang. It was just that they had they had different focuses, and they both it, they both fed off each other, you know. And one probably helped the other one back, and one probably um, in, in in sort of encouraged the other one. But it was a very very good marriage, and there was a good and there was a good empathy. There was a good good vibes about the whole um, business, and people enjoyed working for him. I mean, that was that was a thing that they. Um, that I, I actually felt that with Neville, when working at Neville, Neville was very clever, and he taught me something very, very um, important that I should talk to my business. Uh, like was that it Neville always let the hairdressers shine. Neville, yeah, Neville had his nail on the door. He had this. He had a kudos. He had the status and everything. And the hairdressers that he employed were the stars. He wasn't the star because he already got. He, he, he kind of made it. He made his plateau. And he's resting on that and he's building on that. So us, there was me. There was Michael Shalambers. There was Terry. There was Paul. There was all these people. We were the stars of the show. And what year was this, Joe? Well, this is when Neville 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 Day went on the run. This is the early nineties. Early nineties, okay. So thirty years later, though, there's still two giant brands in our industry, right? Neville's still going today. Neville's still going today, right? Daniel's going strong as well. I mean, Daniel's going stronger. I mean, Daniel's brand is probably a lot stronger than Neville's. We really in, in 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 many ways as well, because you know he's he's got his, his children involved as well, and then fantastic, phenomenal. Um, um, company, uh, I think, uh, which I, I respect highly. But but they're both the, in their different ways, though. Um, and again, Daniel's Daniel for me is master cutter. I mean, Daniel's hairdressing ability is is phenomenal. What he can do with a a brush. I mean, he's the first person I ever saw in my life. Right, it would it would get a get a um, start a blow job by rough around the hair completely. Now, and this is what I learned from that, right? And how do you style hair? You start it from the hair's dry. You don't really start blow drying the hair from wet because mm. the hair's wet. So you're not really styling anything. You know, you can't uh, wrap a tongs around a wet hair or you can't wrap a, a sort of like a brush around around hair and, and make it style. So he, he used to rough dry the hair to about 90% dry and then get the brush and whoosh, 
amazing, amazing finish. Amazing. And I, you, actually, you actually learned that, that um, the best way to style hair is from dry. So all these people saw, when they're rough, dry hair, they don't really know why they're rough, dry. They're just rough, dry. It was a show, whatever. But they had a method. And, and I learned that method, really. Yeah. Yeah, how do you think those two brands are tackling 2020? I mean, obviously, you know, these are two brands that have been around for, for decades but they would never have had to have deal with a pandemic before because obviously this has only really happened um once in a hundred years that's right how do, you think, how do you think do you think they're they're tackling it the same way or do you think that um do you think there'll be differences to how they're going to go about rescuing their salons because obviously for all the small individual salons that are out there and all for the small professionals that are out there um they're going to be looking to someone to for inspiration how they how they need to resurrect their business in 2021 and and, and onwards so how do you think they're both coping with the change well i i think they would they would, they're all going to suffer this like all these big salons are going to suffer is, is the they, they all does have a the, the, their clientele was very diverse. Mm. I, I know when I was uh, in business, and even when I still work for them, they, 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 if you imagine it's like a, a day, a day in the life of a salon in these ultra high network of individuals, you had international clients, you had, you had business clients, you had all these, all these clientels in, in a given day. Now. All these salons are suffering because these cars, not because they don't want to come to them, they can't get it, they can't get to them. It's as simple as that, really. So you've got a lot of restrictions, as in travel and movement, and they don't really cater for local clientele because they're not in localized um, populace, are they? Um, it, you know, so Neville's in in, in Nicebridge. How many people live in Nicebridge? There's a lot of people. There's a lot of houses there, but there's there's a lot of transient clients there. Daniel's in Mayfair. Again, how many people live in Mayfair? Yes, yeah, there's a lot of transit people in Mayfair too. But they, they can't really all sort of all of a sudden change their clientele. So, and the cars that they have, they did have what they have got. They they can't fly. They can't sort of like move from um, from the country to to um, into central London. So there's a lot of restrictions. So I will think that every salon, the top salons in, in central London, are going to suffer the same way. Not just Neville and Daniel. But they seem to have to literally re restructure their whole um, salon gift for an, a new clientele because the that's that's that that's how they will survive. The old clientele, you have to look at it, that's that's part of that. they're gone, they're dead. I'm not saying they die literally, but they can't rely on them anymore because they're not around. So they have to look at new audiences. Um, sure. And how they go do that, that's that that's their problem. It's not my it's not for me to um So essentially they've got to do this, right? <laughs> that's right. They've got to build back better, right? That's right. And 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 also, you know, how many people do you honestly think could afford three, four hundred pound haircuts or five hundred pound colours? How many people do you think? There's a certain age group that can afford that, a certain age group. They could probably afford it, but they won't pay it. So again, it, it's all it's all this restructuring, isn't it? That's they're all gonna do it. They, they have to. So Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting to see what's going on right now. Um <clears throat> you know, we ju- where I mean what I suppose we should start every show by like saying the date, what date it is, November the thirtieth. 2020 we are literally three two days two or three days away from being allowed to go back to work as hairdressers um still with the restrictions that have been in place all year round um how do you feel about these restrictions that the government are putting on us i mean uh, i would i would argue they're not really helping our industry in any way shape or form these restrictions are damaging what is left of our industry right after this year they're different i mean but it's not just hairdressing right it's it's, it's all it's all industries okay it's all shop owners it's all it's all businesses apart from online so so they're they're not going to go into this conspiracy 
hero or um, sinister, whatever. But it, every business has has been affected. But having said that, I mean, I live in Islington. Yeah, there's a few shops shut down, but also there's a few shops thriving. So again, it, it's a case of like, what what do people what people need to what they don't need anymore, really? Because I think there was a bit of excessiveness wherever you went. There was too many hairdressers sales in one street for a start. There was too many fashion shops in one street. There was too much of everything, wasn't there? Mm. And and the way I sort of see all this. Um, pandemics, it, it's retail cleansing. I mean, I mentioned this before and I will mention it again. It's retail cleansing. The ones which are all having cash flow problems now, then they had, they, they would have more likely had business problems. They're going to use COVID-19 as an excuse to um, get out or to fail or whatever. And the ones which will survive, they, they, already, they already had a good, strong foundation in it. So they will survive and they'll go into, uh, into a different sort of level. So you got you got to look at the positives and you got to look at the uh, the negatives. Yes, it's it's sad, but also at the same time, no hairdressing salons were shut. People were still getting their haircuts, right? Because we know the mobile industry, as in the freelance hairdressers, have increased tenfold. Okay, so again, the industry hasn't suffered directly. It is that. These shop owners of uh, the salon owners have suffered directly, sure. really. But hairdressers, you know, if they had the division the and they got the um, the, the, the sort of the the um, encouragement, they'd be going to clients' houses. Mm. And and I've seen that increase because I mean I I go website as you know I'm, I I saw like do a bit of freelancing still I'm not entirely retired, and I think I was getting a lot of inquiries but I'm you know unfortunately they weren't prepared to pay my prices and I said no thank you to, to you know I'm not going to sort of like mm. sort of like entertain that but there is a big demand for mobile home hairdressing services. And- sure. So with that in mind. Um, the PR of hairdressing industry, beauty industry in general, obviously took a massive hit this year when it was labelled non-essential by the government. It essentially put us into this bucket of, yeah, um, people don't really need um, these to see these people, so therefore we can close them up. But obviously what we have seen over the last six months is, is a bit of uh, an outcry against that because we have... <laughs> Um, seen um, the hairdressing salons as the pillar of every community. You know, there's two or three in every little town. Uh, and it seems to be a pillar of that community where people go and they feel good about themselves. And, you know, to be labelled non-essential, and yet we bring quite a lot of joy to people's lives, well, yeah. kind of is a bit of a contradiction. Um, do you agree really, no. with that statement or not? No, it was, it was an interpretation of non-essential, right? As in non-essential travel, okay? So you, a person living in Leicester... Right, we, and we we have done clients coming from all over um, the country. That it it was literally not essential to go and get your hair done in central London or or go to Manchester to get your hair done. You know, when you're 50, 60 miles away. So they had to, I suppose, they had to sort of categorise as a not essential, as in non essential travelling to. It, it, you don't really need to go to that salon. Your sure, family. but but as we've seen this year, words are powerful, right? People get cancelled because other people. People uh, don't like the projection that they're putting into these words. So people are being cancelled left, right and centre for words they say. And now we've got a government labelling, I think it's around about half a million people as essentially frivolous. You know, when they say not non-essential, it's a frivolous. it does make it frivolous, doesn't it? Well, not really, it's a frivolous exercise because you know, why would anyone, right, go to... Um, travel so 20, 30 miles, right? To go and get their head done. I mean, they can actually go around the corner. Like you sort of said, local sales are private. I mean, we, we know one guy um, in Canby Island, John Cagliano, right, uh, I believe. He's benefited from all this. You know, there's, there's um, all these local sellers all benefiting from it. So because all of a sudden, it, it's, it's, it plays with people's consciousness now to think, you know, environmental issues, 
um, health issues. You know, all these things come into their, into their psyche now in making an appointment to go to the hairdressers. They don't really need to do it anymore. So it, it actually it becomes a non-essential exercise to actually go to a top flight salon when you can actually go to a local salon or even get this, the hairdressers to come to you. So, yeah, I, yeah I, can, I kind of agree with you on that, but I will put the point to you that people have their favourites um, and people will make journeys to go and see their favourites, no matter what it is, no matter, no matter whether that, that is their favourite football team, whether that's their favourite restaurant. Not you know, a favourite hairdresser is going to be the same. Um, you know, people come to me from all over Essex, you know, so... Uh, and, and and likewise with you, you know, you have people fly in that come and see you specifically. I, I, I've assumed I haven't seen this year. I'm assumed well, this of year. course, yeah. Okay, but uh, let's go back. We're talking about central London now, right? I mean, the, the conversation was, was was about sort of how someone like Neville and Daniel will sort of like get affected by it. Now, again, okay, let's take someone from sort of Essex here yeah, going going into sort of central London to have their hair done. They will drive in, right? You know, an ultra high. Network individual not going to take. They might take a first class train. They might do, but they're more than likely to drive drive in, right? So they may drive into London, fifty pound congestion charge, okay? And then you've got your parking, which is a good day's um, parking, right? So it's about forty fifty quid that they're going to they're going to, they're going to pay. Right, just to come yeah, to, to mention, these people aren't at work anyway, so it's not like they have a need to go for London, okay, so they are but... going to have to look elsewhere. Or if they've got that much money, they can get the hairdresser to travel to them wherever that's they what, are. That's what they're doing now. Now, before, right, when there was all these other indulgences, when there was a sort of mass greed, look, look at me type of culture, right? It didn't bother them, but now, right, it's actually playing into their psyche now. Do I really need to do this? Do I need to risk my health? Do I really need to do this? Do I really need to do that? Just, mm. just to go and do that. Before, right, there was no question they would do it. Now they're questioning what they're doing. And I think that's what COVID's done now. It is, and the government, when they were labelled them um, hairdressing and non-essential, is people have questioned themselves, do I really need to do this? And their answer is no, they don't. Because at the end of the day, there's no much difference. I mean, today's hairstyles, we could talk about this in, in future um, episodes. For today's hairdressing is not exactly exciting now, is it, really, if you think about it? You know, it's long hair, it's a bit of tongue in, a little bit of this, a little bit of balayage, a little bit of um, satouche, a little bit of harlots, right? And then you take a picture of Instagram, gloss it all up, thank you very much. It's not rocket science, really. No, no, I I get that. Yeah, I I suppose this era or this decade has been the hardest one to really define in terms of a trend. I mean, for guys, it's been the skin fade and beard, right? Exactly. And for girls, it's been the colour or the balayage, you know, combined with that texture of a a curl or a wave. So we we define our entire decade in, in two styles. I suppose that would be it. Exactly. And you, you know my wife, right? You know, she's in property and she's been cutting my hair for the last six months. You know, do you know what I mean? And you know what, right? Okay, there's a few steps here and there, but I'll tell you something, it's, it's a lot more fun when my wife cut my head and go to um, a hairdresser's, that's for sure. Really. Yeah, you're going to struggle to make money out of her though, mate, because <laughs> if it's only your hair she can cut, then... Okay, no. I'm a hair, and the worst people in the world to cut hair right, is hairdressers, okay? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? um, so, so definitely, it's it, it, there, there's there's so many um, scenarios you can look at with what how the industry is going to go with COVID. But what one thing that they all seem to be bleeding about, right, is that they want to go back to where it was. You know, when, when I look at look, when you look at sort of LinkedIn Pro, part of Facebook and all these like, they all want to go back to the way it was. News, You've just discovered LinkedIn this year, is that right? That's right. In, in the in the first lockdown, I thought, well, let's go on to it. Let's have a bit of fun, you know, just to sort of like see what's happening. And uh, yeah, it's uh, and I, what's what I mean, you know, why would why would you use LinkedIn? I mean, what is it with LinkedIn that that drew you to the site? I don't know. I've got a friend of mine actually, is a guy called Larry Bates. Um, he's, he's in Canada, right? And he was a banker. <laughs> And he, he he actually took retirement a few years ago. Uh, he's, he's slightly younger than me as well. He took retirement um, 
three years ago to to very much to the month actually. And um, in that time, he wrote a book called How to Beat the Bank about how um, banks don't really do trade um, investors any favors, right? And he and he, he just a guy talking from a first day experience, right? And um, so he wrote a book. So I thought, you know what? Well, because of um, he's, he's always been inviting me to go to Canada, and you know, let's meet up and let's do that because. Um, did you ever meet now? Did you ever play golf with him? I um, mean, um, did you ever play golf with us at the Grove? You didn't, did you? I, I, think, oh. I think, yeah, I think you did. And um, so I thought, you know, I'll link up with him and on, on LinkedIn. So uh, just to communicate. Anyway, it, it kind of grew from there, really, to where I got like from one connection. I think I've got about 157 connections and nothing sort of business related at all, like, you know what I mean? Mm. And um, anyway, so and then there's all these head other hairdressers, and you kind of start listening to their. Um, well, I'm not listening. You, you them bleating about the same boring issues in these um, hairdressing councils, these um, associations, these federations, these organisations, or whatever. Right? It is so boring. I mean, it really is. So- so basically, you've discovered what trolling is, right? This year, I suppose if you call it trolling, but I, I mean, I like to be honest. I, I like to be very frank because I've got no agenda. Okay, I've got nothing to sell. I've got nothing to hide. I've, I've done it. Thank you very much. You've got nothing to buy as well, right? Yeah, exactly. So you know, if you like me, you like me. If you don't like me, fine. You know, it's not going to hurt me. I'm not going to get upset. I'm not going to call you names or anything like that. So I go in there and I listen. And the great thing about being a hairdresser. Is to be able to be able to interpret someone's um, request or question or whatever, because you know, I can imagine you've got a client in front of you who says, "Oh, I like something different, but I don't want to take too much off." Well, what does it tell you? You know, what I mean, you go do a complete restart, do, doing um, a half an inch haircut. Okay, but mm. a great hairdresser could interpret that. Said, okay, she is prepared to take the risk. She is prepared to do something different. Now, do I say this is what I'm going to do, or do I just do it? Now, so your hairdressing communication skills transferred to being an online troll. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, no, because you read... your second career. No, no, yeah, no, because you read the words, don't you? That when when someone posts something, right, you're reading what they're saying. Yeah, but context is a very difficult thing to translate when written down, right? It is, and yeah, you know, and and you, you have to interpret what they're saying, right? And and a lot of things that I realise, I you know, we, there's one person that I tend to follow, right? And every time she posts something. She's got like 1,500 followers, and yet she's only getting two, three, four comments. And the only kind of time she actually gets any engagement with the comments, right, is when I actually make a comment because it doesn't agree with what she's sort of saying. But, mm. there's, but she gets about 50, 60 people saying, yeah, you're fantastic, you're great, you're an inspiration. But I'm thinking, where's the inspiration? You know, you actually made a point, which is quite irrelevant, really. And who are you sucking up to? You know, sure. is, is the, there's a new word I learned, it's called... Virtual singling is your virtual singling, right? I learned that, and that's what they're doing all the time. So people on um, on LinkedIn, that's what they're doing. God Almighty! I mean, so do you enjoy your LinkedIn um, check-ins every day, or I mean, is it a source of entertainment for you, or or do you like? I mean, obviously you're you're semi-retired, right? You're still doing a bit of hair here and there, but obviously you've got a lot of knowledge to give. Um, and is this the most proactive way that you can do it by trolling people? No, 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 no. Because I must admit, I personally love reading your LinkedIn. Uh, and if anyone wants to follow Joe, just um, search Joe Mehmet, J-O-E-M-E-H-M-E-T on LinkedIn and go and see who he's gone after because, um, like I say, it's, it's it's recommended viewing and reading. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there was one night like, recently, right? There, there was this... I'm not going to say Chinese guy. I don't want to be discriminated with but it was an Oriental guy, right? He was doing this sort of piece of um, tiling on, in a bathroom or a shower room, right? And he was doing it freehand with no grinder. There's, there's dust everywhere. And it, it did a wonderful piece of workmanship, right? Mm. And this guy posted it. And there's all these people going, like, fantastic skills, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, right? And then when you're actually going through, like, you know, sort of like the comments and comments and comments, there's this one guy 
you got to say, well, he's not wearing this, he's not doing this. He's also <laughs> a health and safety issue guy. He's best in America, because I sort of checked him out, right? And this guy's been from the Far East. And he's going through mm. all this negative. He's not sort of saying, mate, you know. Hats off to you. That looks amazing. Well done. Uh, well, I, I mean, I hope you put, it in, put him in, in his place. place. Did you put him in his place, Joe? Yeah, I said, you know, what's it going to do with you? You know what I mean? Just admire the skills. Well, what, you know, the guy doesn't probably understand English, what you're writing about. He probably hasn't got a LinkedIn profile because it he looked like a, you know, it's an employee. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, like, it's like where people aggregate other people's stuff on there, right? And they never give the, the person credit. Uh, uh, you know, See, there's lots of Instagram accounts that all do that, where they basically copy and paste other people's work from all over the world, yeah. post it to their page. Their page gets popular, uh, right. and people seem to think it's those people that are actually doing the work when yeah. it's kind of not. And it's a little yeah, bit exactly disingenuous, right. I think. Yeah, it's exactly. Right. It's insulting, and, and it's exactly. Anyway, there's this one guy, right, who you actually saw, like, Attacked me. He, he literally attacked me for attacking this. Well, I wouldn't do really attack. I just said, say, listen, mate, you know, just in my guy's school, don't be so negative, right? And with this guy called Gary Padgett, Gary with a double R, by the way. All right, you, you're calling him out. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to call him out, yeah, because he went over to this, so like, you know, you, you, he, he actually started saying, right, I was a danger to society. <laughs> <laughs> right? because, well, you know, you can't be, you can't, um, you can't be throwing your speech around this freely, mate. If there's anything we've learned in 2020, <laughs> speech is definitely not free anymore. Exactly, right? Anyway, so I said to him, but why? You know, he goes, well, yeah, is this, is, is that sort of disguise, um, is this sort of pipe fitter, is it a health and safety um, advisor, educator, all these kind of things, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm getting, listen, the guy did his job, right? He didn't cut his hand or anything. Anyway, this guy, Gary Page, he started sending me some posts, right, of of accidents caused by grand grinders and things like that. I said, that's a little irrelevant. It's got nothing to do with the post, like, you know? Anyway, it goes on. They're touting for work, Joe. I mean, isn't that what everyone on LinkedIn's doing? They're all just touting for business, right? It, well, this is it. But you don't, you know, it, it, it's your job's worth, right? It's a job. So I start with so like, There you go. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Right. He's a job's worth. Gary Patchett, you're a job's worth, right? I think this should be a weekly thing we should do. It's called Joe's Call Out of the Week. Anyway, um, you can call someone out for um, a being a job's worth. This is had a conversation. This is the best. I, I've got to hear, right? If, I, if, if it was on um, Zoom or whatever, I could show it to you. This is how he ended the conversation with me. Joe Mehmet, you're a dangerous society. I wish you would go and put your finger in a live socket. <laughs> this is a health and safety guy, yeah? Safety is, oh. Telling me to go and kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what a way to, um, what a way to treat a prospective customer. As I said, said to him, you know, you're a very nice man telling me the guns are like, you know, mm. okay, because this, these are jumps with, you know, I'm, and there was another guy, which I would talk about so later on in LinkedIn, uh, what's his name? Oh, he was so funny. He, oh, that's it. Um, Max, um, what was his name? Max. He, he, he all started with something. Max, he knows who he is. Max Henry, was it Max Henry? In America, he, he started with something, and I kind of then just made a point about, uh, you know, wars being sort of like um, manufactured by liberal elites. You know, mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, under the, you know, sort of the, these American presidents, right, who, um, who go to other countries to preach their poison because they do not like the country's culture or their uh, regimes, all right? right? And there was a sort of brave soldier who died for for no reason, basically speaking. So I kind of put, you know, call, wars are caused by liberal elites, you know, with no right to go into being other countries' um, politics. Anyway, this guy Max, I started sort of beating about, you know, Donald Trump and Donald Trump this and Donald Trump. And I said, well, you know, right, Donald Trump never causes wars. So why are you being so nasty, Donald Trump? And he, he starts sort of saying about his Donald Trump's this, Donald Trump. And I said, well, not really. I mean, I, I, I tell you, I, look, I didn't vote in American um, election. I've got no. Donald Trump doesn't affect me whatsoever over here. He doesn't pay my mortgage. He doesn't pay my bills. So it doesn't affect me whatsoever. So he started going about this and that. And I go, well, I think a bit. 
So, so once again, it's about freedom of speech, right? Yeah. This is a case of uh, this person seems to think that Donald Trump saying some words is more dangerous than actually dropping bombs on people's heads. Exactly, right? Anyway, so he started, he started thinking, right? And I said to him, well, look, you know, you are a liberal elite because, you know, you, you actually don't, you can't tolerate tolerance. You know, I mean, you, you, you preach a preach, but, you know, you can't accept people's differences. And I, and I said to him, look, I'm a smoker, okay? I, I, and also, I can't smoke anywhere. And he goes, well, what you do with your body, you put all that poison in your body and this and that, blah, 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 blah right? It's your affair. But don't teach me. Um, and I said, but I'm not teaching you. I'm just saying to you. Right. Then he started giving me all these medical um, reports. And I said to him, Max, you're in retail, you're a sales consultant. How you, can you be an expert in medical um, sort of like science to tell me smoke is bad? What gives you the right to tell me? Well, no, don't segue to e experts, Joe. I mean, that would get us on a whole nother branch of thought. I mean, because experts have pretty much ruined this country this year, right? Anyway, yeah, very much so. Anyway, so he goes into this all like blah, blah, blah. And I said, to him, OK, there's, there is a report that smoking actually prevents Alzheimer's. It pre prevents dementia and it prevents COVID-19. Which there was reports that right? You don't you don't hear about it, but there are these reports, right? Yeah. He won't, he won't accept this. So I said to him, how can you expect accept one medical report, but you deny another medical report? You know, so you're gonna be if you're gonna accept um, opinions and, and really, uh, research, you have to accept the alternatives as well. That's how you become a tolerant society. Right? Yeah, conversation, right? Um, and I think it was Jordan Peterson said, you know, um, in order to think, uh, in order to think, you have to have the right to speech. That's right. So you're going to cause offence somewhere. Yeah. Um, so essentially, banning freedom of speech is essentially banning the ability to think. Which, which, goes, which you know, goes question about LinkedIn, right? That's what I discovered about LinkedIn. It really is not a business portal at all. It's actually a platform for people to preach their stupidity, personally speaking. Absolutely, which is why I'm going to look forward to your call outs of the week on LinkedIn. <laughs> I think this, I think he's got legs, definitely. It is funny. It really is funny how people think they're so clever and yet they're so poisonous. They really are more. It's good. Well, it's like never been more divided, does it, this year? Yeah. You know, I think everyone's got their own little powerful echo chambers now and everyone's got their own truth. And to try and spend your days arguing with people on the internet, only unless you, you, you know, like yourself, you actually get um, some some joy out of it. Um, but it is really a, a waste of time. A lot it of is. Time. I, I, but all, all, look, I mean, there was... There was I've got a Ducati motorbike, as you know, right? And there's a there's a there's a forum in the um, on Facebook, right? Um, Ducati um, Seven Four Eight Owners Club, right? Forum, yeah. Right. Anyway, there was this one guy. He posted this sort of like um, picture of a Harley Davidson. <laughs> you know what I mean? Ducati Owners Network. Yeah, on the Ducati Owners Network, right? So is so, that like a red rag to a ball? I said, to him, like, you know, why the hell would you want to post? Uh -huh, I, listen, you, you have the, the, the LinkedIn troll has been triggered. I mean, he's basically done to you what you do to the big brands and uh, certain people. That's in, right. in well, so, you know, this is what it's all about. It's a game of cat and mouse, mate. Anyway, we're getting to time, so we better like, look to wrap it up. Uh, one last thing. Um, what are you up to this week? You got any plans this week? Well, I've got, um, I'm working tomorrow. I'm working Wednesday, and that's it. I'm, I'm through all week, actually. So I could, I could get some stories for you, actually. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah, I, we've got the, the British Hairdressing Awards tonight. I don't know if you're aware of that. I do know, actually. I, I looked at the contestants. I look at all the, uh, what the, I, 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 no, not contestants, is not the word. It's the, uh, the, um, the finalist. Yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting how diverse they become now. They, they even go to international as well now. They've got new, they've got these new categories now. And, yeah, yeah, there's a few categories that disappeared as well. I remember yeah. a famous category was um, session hairdresser of the year, yeah. which they got rid of because um, my my former boss Eugene Suleiman, I think he won it eight years in a row, and he never turned up once. So yeah. they had to bin that. 
that category because people wouldn't turn up for it. But um, but yeah, well, we'll save that for a future show. Okay. Um, I'm just I'm writing a blog at the moment about remodeling the salon, the salon 2.0. My opening paragraph of the whole um, blog is um, it's essentially the um, we're, what you know will will it be the welcoming and vibrant space that we all fell in love with about our salons, or will it resemble a cold apocalyptic scene of a high street wasteland? Because at the end of the day, every single salon is covered with hazardous tape, toxic things, toxic signage. Everyone inside looks like they're at a clean up at a forensic scene of some like murder because they're all like wearing visors and gloves and you know aprons and this, that, and the other. Do you know what I mean? So so this year, I think it's very, very difficult to look at that. But, you know, um, I'm writing a whole blog. You can go to gosalon.uk to have a look at my blogs if you want. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we can talk about all this more in a, in a, in a later show. Yeah, um, but, but, yeah, I, I, like I say, we're 45 minutes in um, to our pilot episode. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Um, is there anything else that you want to let us know, Joe? Well, I think there's there's some there's so much we can um, talk about. I mean, especially I, I like to discuss this uh, salons of tomorrow actually because I've, I've got very very um, strong view of the, on this uh, subject. Because uh, well, well, look, let's do that in a future episode. Then I have got to publish it first. Um, I've yeah. got comments on there from the likes of Lee Stafford. I think I've got a quote in there from yourself. Um, you know, so I've got a few big salon owners that have all put their tuppence in. So, um, yeah, hopefully it'll be a good read for people. Exactly. Well, no, so I, I hope people will find, find it interesting to, to, to listen to, um, to to our comments, actually, because it's, 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 uh, it's very valid, actually. And people have to change, really, because if they don't change, they're going to die anyway, because, you know, that's, that's the thing. It, there's, a, there's a saying, isn't there? Mm. And that, or you die. That's right. Anyway, on that note, I think we should end it. Um, hope you have a good week, mate. I'll be looking out for your LinkedIn comments. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you next week. I look forward to it. Bye. We did it. We got the first show in the can. If you want to know more about us at all just type salonomics into your instagram or your facebook's and all that malarkey no website as yet but there is one at anchor.fm forward slash salonomics um alternatively follow joe memet on linkedin um it's quite a treat trust me um he's very engaged on there so whatever you do don't trigger him at all because um he's quite sensitive no what am i talking about he ain't at all Tune in some more Salonomics next week. Speak soon.